Okay, let's go to our uh, Sunday School lesson. Turn, if you will, to Psalm 150. Psalm 150. Down at the end. This is close to the end. Let's read the six verses of Psalm 150. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. <laughs> Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. We finally come to the end of the book of Psalms, and we started nearly three and a half years ago, so I can as best as I can recall, and we've come a long way since Psalm 1, verse 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, and so forth. And uh, frankly, I rather doubted my uh, talent or ability to expound this Clearly, but I, I pray that I did so. And uh, when we reached Psalm 119, because it's so long, rather than spend five, six, seven weeks in just one psalm, we uh, hit it all in one day. We hit the highlights, some of the salient verses there. And I'm more convinced than ever before that the book of Psalms has to rate as the most prophetic book in all the Bible, uh, largely because it's the longest book in the Bible, and there's so much material in it, but uh, the recurring theme is the second coming, the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, his defeat of the man of sin, his protection of the Jew during the Great Tribulation, his establishing of a, a kingdom of peace uh, over which the, the world will be governed by him and the universe by extension. <clears throat> but uh, now here in Psalm 150, the term praise him occurs nine times, which is the number of fruitfulness in uh, Bible numerics. For example, there are nine fruits of the spirit, Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23. And the individual word praise occurs 13 times in this psalm. Uh, 13 is usually a negative number. Even the world understands that. There is no 13th floor in a lot of hotels. There is no 13th gate um, on airport, uh, ter uh, many airport terminals. But um, Genesis 13 Verse 13 says, But the men of Sodom were, were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. <laughs> Thirteen words. Uh, Revelation chapter 13 describes the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the mark of the beast in some detail there. You could say, however, it, it, this is a beautiful exception to that general rule, but you could say, that if someone fails to praise God, as this song commands, he's going to be in trouble. Uh, there are two sources of this praise. First of all, praise him in his sanctuary, verse 1. For the angels and the cherubim, that'll be in the third heaven. For men, that'll be here on the earth in a temple in Jerusalem, in the millennium one day. And then also praise him in the firmament of his power. It says there in verse 1. This will be the one mentioned in Psalm 19. And also mentioned in Genesis 1. Which refers to the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets, the galaxies. Everything you see in the night sky is also considered the firmament. And you are to praise him, uh, praise God, for two things. Number one, for his mighty acts. 
as mentioned there in verse 2. Um, that should be self-explanatory. But, but when you think about what God is able to do and what God has done, it staggers the mind. It really does. Um, and also praise him for his excellent greatness. We sang a song in church earlier, praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed redeemer. And uh, how could you ever praise God for everything that he has created or made? You can never exhaust uh, a list like that. You could, you, could be, you could be listing things for eternity. If you were to count and list things that God has done and the acts of God and his greatness. I go back to a few places. Look back at, or just over Psalm 148. Verse 13 there says, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. Amen. His glory is above the earth and heaven. Go back um, to Psalm 145. Psalm 145, verse 4, says, One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. Go back again, um, even farther back to Psalm 89. Psalm 89, verse 5. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. And then back to Psalm 76, verse 4. Psalm 76, 4. Thou art more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. And one more, back in Psalm 7. Psalm 7, and verse 17. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness, and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Uh, Elizabeth, who is not here today, but uh, she noticed... The, the songs that we we sing, um, how many of them in our in our hymn book are praises to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Everything that that name means, everything that that name signifies and conveys to the believer. Uh, that beautiful name, that wonderful name, that matchless name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. And and. And on it goes. Um, and then in our psalm today, there are nine things you are to praise him with. They're listed for us in the psalm. The trumpet, that's a horn, and trumpet's a trumpet, and most people would understand that. Whether uh, um, it was a horn made out of um, um, an animal's horn that they had converted, but made into a a musical instrument or something to give a signal. Uh, we think of trumpets today that have three specific valves on them, and uh, the position of the fingers creates the different musical notes. And then other instruments based on the trumpet by extension, uh, the trombone, that would be one. Uh, in Pensacola at the Bible Baptist Church there, Dr. Ruckman played the tuba in his own church orchestra. The, the platform is elevated off the main floor about three feet. And so the, the ground floor in front of the front pews, there's enough room for, they have about a 30, 35 piece volunteer orchestra, church members, old people, young uh, people, men, women. And if you got an instrument and you can play it, they can fit it into an orchestra setting. Uh, no electric guitars, no rock music, none of that. But uh, he played the tuba while the song leader led the songs. And he would joke and say, uh, God has chosen the bass things of the world. And so forth. 
but um, so you can the, so the trumpet and other instruments <coughs> derived from it uh, would be counted. He says um, the psaltery. Now psaltery, I tried to make sure I understood what that was. The definition of a psaltery, at least today, is imprecise. I found one dictionary that tried to describe it as a, a boxed instrument with strings stretched across the surface so that when you pluck it, uh, it would, it would uh, resonate inside the, the, the box like an echo chamber. And if that's the case, then other instruments based on that uh, concept would have to include a, a box guitar. Yeah. Whether a steel string guitar or a nylon string guitar. And other instruments very similar where, uh, think of the upright bass. <coughs> Where I don't believe you play a uh, upright bass, do you, Brother Charles, with a with a no. But do they play an upright bass with a uh, a bow? Yeah. Oh, they do. Okay. So that would that would but but anything played against a um, oh what would be the right the term against the uh, tension or the neck or something like that so that the vibration creates an echo inside the instrument would also be in that same family. And we'll get to that in a moment. But actually, <clears throat> go if you will, I want you to go if you will to uh, four places in the Bible. We'll start with Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. It's kind of nice having a, a world-class orchestra musician in our congregation. You can ask him musical questions uh, for clarification. Isaiah 5, and notice there are verse, uh, verses 11 and 12. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them, and the harp and the viol, V-I-O-L, the tabret and pipe and wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Also go to Isaiah 14 and verse 11. Isaiah 14, um, verse 11, Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. This is for someone who is in rebellion against God. Go to the book of Amos, chapter 5. Amos 5, um, verses 22 and 23. Well, let's back up to verse 21. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. And I, in Amos 6, uh, we'll start at verse 3. Ye that put far away the evil day, and cause the seat of violence to come near, that lie upon beds of ivory, and stretch themselves upon their couches, and eat the lambs out of the flock, and the calves out of the midst of the stall that chant to the sound of a viol and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. The word V-I-O-L, viol, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, we derive from that the word violin, viola. 
and I suppose along with that would be the cello and then the upright bass. Instrument, stringed instruments like that, that play against a, a hollow body uh, so that the sound uh, emanates. It. Of course, the bigger the, the uh, um, body of the instrument, the deeper the sound is going to be, the more uh, sonorous uh, noise is going to come out of it. But uh, I was curious, in those four verses which mention the, the word viol, like I say, from which we get the words violin, viola, viola. Do you notice all four of those places are negative? And the first one there in Isaiah 5, verses 11 and 12, talk about people who love nothing more than to listen to fine uh, music while they're sipping wine and, and eating cheese with their friends and getting drunk. And nothing more that disgusts me more than the two or three times we've gone down to the um, Messiah sing-along at the Disney concert hall. 2,000 people are there. Of course, this is Disney. you got to take that into account. Disney is a big Mickey Mouse company, if you ask me. <laughs> but, but during the intermission, people are there listening to some of the greatest music ever written and recorded by a or written, composed by a man who actually knew Jesus Christ, George Frederick Handel. And all these people could think about was what kind of wine they were going to have during the break. They're just there as uh, Los Angeles, uh, Beverly Hills, Southern California snobs that love classical music. They think because they, they these things enrich my soul. That's all the religion I need. And they're there just to be entertained. They weren't there to really think of God or enjoy what, what the message of the, the, the um, piece con conveys. They're not interested in that at all. There's nothing more despicable than someone who would take something so beautiful and only use it as a, as a reason to go uh, out drinking with their friends uh, during the intermission. You know, there are lots of people like it, but it's also a, kind of a mixed blessing to go there because there are also people sitting behind you who are talking about the Lord and they enjoying it as Christians ought to enjoy it. It's a mixed bag when you get 2,000 people there, 2,200 people there. Uh, you never know what you're going to get. But usually when you go to Los Angeles, you have a good idea what you're going to get. 